This video came about as a result of me watching the made for television 1988 production of Nitty the Enforcer. Frank Nitty was the person who took over from Al Capone when the latter was sent to prison. As far as the mafia genre type of film is concerned, I thought the film was quite good, although there's a lot of fiction rather than fact in it. But this is not a film review. If you want to see it, there's a link below, but I'd advise it to be quick because it's on YouTube and I could see it coming off before long. It is my strict policy on YouTube in general, in the comments section, never to spoil a film for others by revealing too many details. So I hope it won't be spoiling your future watching of this film by saying that part of the plot involves the mayor of Chicago being corrupt and trying to take over Al Capone's territory when the latter is sent to prison. The police raid Nitty's premises on the orders. This how it happens in the film. The orders are made directly or indirectly of the mayor and an attempt to murder Nitty is made, but he survives. In the film, the mayor in turn is later murdered by the mob. You don't actually see it, but the references are made to it. In real life, there was an attempt to murder Frank Nitti, which took place on the 19th of December 1932, when a squad of the Chicago police, led by Detective Sergeants Harry Lan and Harry Miller, raided Nitti's office in room 554 at 221 North LaSalle Street in Chicago. Lang shot Nitti three times in the back and neck. He then shot himself giving himself a minor flesh wound to make the shooting look like self-defense, claiming that Nitty had shot him first. You wouldn't get away with that today, but then perhaps they didn't realize how blood splatters uh, occurred at different ranges. Several weeks later, after this incident, Chicago Mayor Anton Chernak died from injuries received as a result of a gunshot wound. And that is the subject of this video. Anton Chernak was born on the 9th of May 1873 in Kladno near Prague, which was then in Austro-Hungary. Of course, today it's the capital of Czechia. Prague is not uh, Kladno. <laughs> His father was a miner. His parents immigrated to the United States in 1874. He initially followed in his father's footsteps and became a miner. Age 16, he moved to Chicago where he worked as a tow boy. In those days, the trams needed to get up hills and the tow boy was the person who would wait for a tram at the bottom of a hill with a horse and then hitching up the horse, he would help pull the tram up the hill. Once the tram got the top of the hill, the tow boy would go back down the hill with his horse and wait for the next tram. Uh, after doing this a while, he got an another job in the stables, uh, so he looked after the horses when they were at home, so to speak, and in the evening he would study. He gathered enough money looking after the horses to be able to buy his own horse and cart and start a business collecting disused wooden items, which he would chop up and sell for firewood. His horse and cart allowed him later to move into haulage. As this business grew and he became more wealthy, got involved in politics, which in turn aided his business opportunities, above all in real estate and financial services. So it was a real rags to riches story for this immigrant. A story made in America when in 1931 he became mayor of Chicago. Anton Chernak had a number of health problems and frequently would visit Florida for its climate. There's a link below to an article in the Surgery Journal which goes into more detail about them. And above all, his medical history after he was shot. And uh, that's what I'm now going to come on to. 
In the beginning of the 1930s, Chicago had a number of problems, not least of which was organized crime and the corruption that it brought with it. This in turn led to severe financial problems for the city and Chernock sought the assistance of President-elect Franklin D. Roosevelt to get federal funding for infrastructure projects. In those days, the presidential election was in November, as it is now, but the president was sworn in in March and not in January as at present. On the 15th of February 1933, Roosevelt was passing through Miami after a fishing trip to the Bahamas and a meeting between him and Chernak was arranged. A large crowd had gathered to see it and hear the president-elect speak at a park. Roosevelt sat on the top of the back seat of his convertible to give a very short speech around 9.40 in the evening of that day. Now, the plan was for him then to have a few words with Chernak after he had finished speaking. After the speech, Chernak, who was sitting with other dignitaries just steps away from the convertible, moved to the running board to shake hands and speak with the president-elect. After speaking a few words with Roosevelt, as Chernak moved away from the vehicle, a labourer, Giuseppe Zangara, fired either five or six shots, five of which hit someone. Giuseppe Zangara was born in Ferruzzano in the province of Reggio Calabria on the 7th of September 1900. Ferruzzano suffered from poverty augmented by natural disasters. The village was damaged on the 8th of September 1905 by an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.9, some 100 kilometers to the north. However, on the 23rd of October 1907, there was a much more serious earthquake. It had a magnitude of 5.9 at a depth of 33 kilometers and Ferruzzano was close to the epicenter. Of 2,000 people living in Ferruzzano, 158 were killed and most houses were either collapsed or were badly damaged. On the 17th of November 1907 and the 23rd of January 1908, there were further earthquakes and on the 28th of December 1908, Europe's greatest natural disaster occurred in the Straits of Messina, very close to Ferruzzano, and the Messina earthquake and tsunami occurred, and I've done a separate video on that if you are interested. Today, the population is less than half of what it was when Zangara was born. Zangara was conscripted to fight in the final part of the First World War. Now, I've done videos where I refer to the fate of the people from southern Italy fighting in the mountains of the north against the Austro-Hungarians. Conditions in the Italian army were deplorable and discipline was draconian. Calabrians like Zangara probably would not have been able to understand their often brutal officers and then faced serious punishment for not filling orders they did not understand. He returned from the war to perform physical labour and continue his life in poverty in Calabria. In these circumstances, it should be no surprise that he saw no future in Italy, and in 1923 he emigrated to the United States with his uncle. He initially settled in Patterson, New Jersey, working as a bricklayer and joined the Bricklayers' Union. He acquired U.S. citizenship on the 11th of September 1929. Around 1932, he moved to Miami, Florida, because due to his health, he suffered a lot from the harsh winters in the north of the United States and was unable to work during the winter months. So he hoped that the much milder climate in Florida would make it easier for him to make a living. As you can see from this photograph taken after he was arrested following the assassination attempt, Zangara was of a very slender build. He was barely 150 centimeters tall and weighed around 50 kilos. 
He suffered from severe pain in his abdomen, which was not alleviated even by an appendectomy he underwent in 1926. Doctors who performed Zangara's autopsy attributed the cause of the problem to adhesions found on his gallbladder as a result of chronic indigestion. In the statements at the trial and in some comments he made in prison, Zangra attributed the cause of his pains to the very strenuous manual labour that he was forced to do as a child on his father's farm. He stated that he began to suffer it from it from the age of six. His physical problems may have led to or contributed in any case to mental instability. Sometime in the first weeks of 1933, he purchased a .32 pistol of the US Revolver Company from a pawn shop for $8. To put this into context, later in 1933, the minimum wage was set at 25 cents per hour, so it would have represented around four days pay for Zangara. In today's terms, we could multiply the $8 by uh, around 20 to get an idea of how much things cost today as opposed to how much they cost then. Roosevelt's speech was somewhat impromptu, but chairs were available and a crowd had started to gather around one hour before he actually spoke. Because he was so short, Zangara stood on a folding chair in order to have a clear view of the rally and its target. He fired his weapon at a range of around six meters. At the time he was shooting, Lillian Cross, a lady standing next to Zangara, hit Zangara's arm with her handbag and spoiled his aim, while others in the crowd grabbed him and held him down until the police arrived. Zangara was initially imprisoned in Dade County Courthouse a cell in Miami, where he confessed his intentions, stating that he wanted to kill first the kings and presidents and then all the capitalists. He was put on trial very quickly and received an 80-year sentence, which was the maximum possible, although he challenged the judge to give him 100 years. At the trial, he referred to the pains he was suffering from and his contempt for the capitalists. On the 6th of March 1933, 19 days after the assassination attempt and two days after Roosevelt's presidential inauguration, Anton Chermak died in hospital. In the link to the Journal of Surgery article, you can see how his health improved only to get worse later. At this point, one of the charges of attempted murder turned into a first-degree murder charge for Zangara, who was retried on the 9th of March 1933. Since he had already confessed to his murderous intentions, it was not relevant either that the person actually dead was not his original target or the fact that Chermak's death could arguably be traced to part to medical errors. In any case, he, he would still have been guilty according to the doctrine of aberratio ictus, that is to say, transferred intent. Uh, that is to say, he'd meant to kill one person, he missed and he killed someone else. So even though it was an accident that he killed someone else, he was still guilty of murder. Even faced with the murder charge and knowing what the consequences would be, Zangara again pleaded guilty and was thus sentenced to death. Here you can see the death warrant. Once the sentence was pronounced, Zangara declared in his broken English that he was not afraid of the electric chair and did not care about the sentence and that he considered the judge one of the capitalists and a criminal. Zangaro was transferred to the Florida Strait Prison in Rayford. The prison had only one cell in which the condemned inmate spent his last days, leading to his execution. But since that cell was already occupied and Florida law required inmates awaiting execution to be housed in single cells, the prison had to expand its facilities. And this is how the actual Florida State Prison death row was created.
On the 20th of March, 1933, after spending only 10 days on death row, Giuseppe Zangara was executed in the electric chair of the Florida State Prison in Ryford, Florida. Apparently, Zangara was furious when he learned that his last moments of life would not be filmed or photographed. And on this, I must absolutely agree and sympathize. I mean, I've got a YouTube channel. Supposing I was going to be executed, and then I find out just moments before the execution that they're not going to do a film of it, I mean, a premiere, just think how many views that would get. Anyway, that apart. So, Zangara's last words were, Long live Italy. Goodbye to all the poor people in the world. Press the button. Come on, press the button. From the day he was arrested, he was tried twice and executed all in just 33 days. That speed was quick, even for 1933. I mean, these days, one's lucky if they do the whole lot in 33 years. After the execution and the autopsy, his body was interred in the prison cemetery. The tomb is marked with a plaque, but the surname is erroneously spelled Zangana instead of Zangara. The most widespread and commonly accepted idea is that Giuseppe Zangara intended to kill President-elect Roosevelt, but that he missed his target hitting Chermak and four others by mistake. The film I mentioned earlier dates to 1988, and whereas I appreciate that it's a film made for television, it suggests that Zangara was hired by Frank Nitti, the head of the criminal organization known as the Chicago Outfit. The aim of Nitti was to eliminate Chermak. Author John William Tuchy, who specializes in organized crime Chicago, analyzed reports from the United States Secret Service, and in a 2002 article, that was to say 14 years after the film was made, detailed the reasons why Chermak was the real target. The author also linked the assassination attempt to escalating gang violence in Chicago. Those who support the mafia hypothesis refer to the fact that Zangara, in the period he spent in the Italian army at the end of the First World War, was noted for being a crack shot. The flaws in this argument are obvious, I think. Uh, first of all, he was physically much weaker than he had been as a teenager some 15 years earlier. He had been forced to climb onto a rickety folding chair to shoot and that his experience as a sharpshooter would have involved the use of a rifle and not a revolver. So, in short, I think that this attempted assassination has a number of similarities with the JFK killing just over 30 years later, or at least as far as the conspiracy theory goes. I think it was Vincent Bugliosi who wrote words to the effect that if organized crime had hired someone like Lee Harvey Oswald to carry out the killing of President Kennedy, then one needs to question the abilities of their HR department. And certainly, this is just as much the case in the attempted uh, assassination of Roosevelt or the actual assassination of Chermak. Thanks very much for listening. This is slightly different than the sort of thing I normally do, but it is still 20th century history. In fact, it's taken place in 1933, which is a year I have, think I have done more videos on than any other year, so far at least. So I publish uh, every Friday at 8 in the evening my time. That's Berlin time, Central European time and at an hour earlier in the UK and all sorts of times in all sorts of other countries. And my specialization is modern European history and above all in the Holocaust. Thanks very much for listening and I hope you'll subscribe.